This video will introduce the concept of reduced mass and solve the problem for what mass we should use in the harmonic oscillator model system. So we have our harmonic oscillator model. We have atom 1 with mass 1. We have atom 2 with mass 2. These two are bonded together by some spring constant k. So they feel a potential energy function between them where v of x equals 1 half kx squared x is defined as the bond length minus the equilibrium bond length, r0, and r is defined as the absolute value of x2 minus x1, the position of atom 2 minus the position of atom 1. Okay, the force that these feel relative to one another is the negative first derivative of the potential energy with respect to x, which is the force. We know that force equals mass times acceleration, which is mass times the second derivative of position with respect to time. So when we solve this in the classical case for the classical harmonic oscillator, we got that the position x of t, so the bond lengths deviations away from equilibrium over time, were equal to some amplitude times cosine omega t, where omega, the angular velocity, is equal to the square root of the spring constant k divided by the mass of the system. So the question is, in all these cases, in Newton's second law, in the angular velocity, what mass should we be using? Should it be mass 1, mass 2, or something completely different? The thing that we're going to end up using is called the reduced mass, so let's see why that is. Okay, so we can write Newton's second law for each of these individual atoms here. So f equals ma for each of them, so m1 times second derivative of position 1 with respect to time equals k times x2 minus x1 minus r0, so that's from v of x equaling 1 half kx squared, x equals r minus r0, and r equals x2 minus x1, so k times x2 minus x1 minus r0, which is equal to kx. All right, for particle two, we have m2 times second derivative of position two with respect to time equals, and that's the reverse of this, it's minus k x2 minus x1 minus r0 equals minus kx. So the, the force that these two feel is the opposite of each other, which makes sense because Newton's third law is that there's an equal and opposite force for every force that a given particle feels. So they feel the corresponding opposite forces to one another. So these forces summed up together, since this one feels a force of kx, this one feels a force of negative kx. So m1 times the acceleration of x1 plus m2 times the acceleration of x2 is equal to zero. So we're going to factor out m1 plus m2 here to to, and then multiply times the second derivative with respect to time of m1x1 plus m2x2, and then we're going to divide by m1 plus m2 to get this m1 plus m2 to factor out here. So we have m1 plus m2 is the total mass of the system. We're going to call that big M. And this quantity in here, m1x1 plus m2x2 over m1 plus m2, this is actually the center of mass of the molecule. If, if particle 1 weighs more, then it's going to be more towards atom 1. If atom 2 weighs more, it's going to be more towards atom 2. But this is the formula for the center of mass of two particles in space. OK, so this says that big M times the second derivative of big X, the center of mass with respect to time, equals 0. So this first equation here tells us that the center of mass doesn't move over time. And that's good because there's no external force acting on this pair of atoms. They're only feeling the forces relative to one another. So nothing's pushing the entire molecule in any direction, causing it to translate. This is just a vibration. It's a movement of the internal atoms. OK, so now let's take the opposite case. We're going to do the second derivative of x2 with respect to t minus the second derivative of x1 with respect to t. So this is equal to, for the first case, this is this case kx over m1 
uh, for the second atom it's minus kx over m2. So this here would be minus kx over m2, as we mentioned. For this one it's minus this value, which is equal to kx over m1, and then times minus 1. So we have minus k over m2x minus k over m1x. All right, so this is equal to the second derivative with respect to time of x2 minus x1, which is equal to, on the other side, if I factor out k, minus k times 1 over m1 plus 1 over m2 times x. All right, so now we're going to introduce the value mu, which is called the reduced mass. So 1 over m1 plus 1 over m2 equals 1 over mu. So mu, our reduced mass, is equal to the inverse of 1 over m1 plus 1 over m2. And you should be able to convince yourself through algebra that this is equal to m1 m2 over m1 plus m2. It's the product of these two masses divided by their sum. Okay, so if we, do, if we multiply both sides by 1 over m1 plus 1 over m2 to the minus 1, this is going to go away, and we're going to get a 1 over m1 plus m2, or sorry, 1 over m1 plus 1 over m2 over here. So what we're going to get is mu times d squared x, which is x2 minus x1, uh, minus r0. The minus r0 is going to go away because that's a constant. So this is actually mu times d squared x with respect to t equals minus kx. Now if you'll remember, minus kx is the force that our system is feeling. d squared x dt is the change in the bond length over time. So this is something times acceleration equals force. And we know from Newton's second law that force is what equals mass times acceleration. So in fact, what we've done through this derivation is shown that the mass that we should be using for this angular velocity, and which comes from Newton's second law, is that the mass is the reduced mass of the two atoms, m1 and m2. So our angular velocity is going to be the square root of the k, the spring constant, over mu, the reduced mass where we've shown that the reduced mass here is the product of the two masses, m1 and m2, divided by their sum.